I'm really proud of Spitfire Audio and how we've kept going during this difficult period. In fact, there's not much that we haven't been able to do, but there's one thing I've really missed, and that is going into other people's creative spaces in our series, Creative Cribs. Well, we're back, and not in just any creative space, the creative space, our Avalon, where the soundtracks of our lives have been forged, the hallowed turf of Abbey Road Studio Two. I've worked here many times, but it's always good to be back. This is Mirik. You've been here for a while, haven't you? Uh, yeah, just over 20 years now, I think. Yep, so always a bit of a blur. You know every nook and cranny. Yep, I try my best. For people who are watching who don't know about the kind of why we have reverence for this place, do you want to give us a quick rundown of, of what's been made here? Well, Studio Two, I would say, is probably the most famous studio in the world. 95% of the Beatles' recordings were done in this room. Now, before the Beatles came here, a lot was recorded and then a lot's been recorded since. But I mean, yeah, when people think of Studio Two, they think of the Beatles and quite rightly so. Um, but I mean, this studio has been here since Abbey Road opened in 1931. It was kind of like the, I guess, the pop studio of the time, although what pop music became, they couldn't even fathom that back in 1931. But um, think of like big bands like Joe Loss, Jack Hilton, that sort of thing, like the swing bands, I guess, at the time. So it was, uh, it's like a smaller version of Studio One. I mean, Studio One is the big, huge yeah. orchestral room, big uh, reverberant sound. Uh, this is a bit more kind of controlled, a bit more toned down. Uh, the thing that always gets me whenever I come back is, is actually how, how big it is. So, so what is the, the floor space here? So it's 10 metres by 18 metres. Right. Um, so yes, I mean, it's, it's, by any stretch of the imagination, this is a big recording studio, so it's not as big a studio one, I suppose. So if you were to get an orchestra in here, how many could you, you squeeze in? You could, a push, you could probably squeeze about 40 or 50 in here. It might be a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, okay. most sections you see in here, pretty more like sort of 30 odd. I mean, the room was originally designed for kind of smaller chamber ensembles as well, or larger chamber ensembles, I should say. Yeah. It was designed with strings in mind, if you like. Okay. Should we have a, just kind of a little kind of wander around? Is the, the, the look of the studio as it was originally or...? You know? Pretty much. I mean, the shape, the floor, the walls, pretty much as it was in 1931 when the studios opened. It was, if anything, they had the reverse of the problem they had in Studio One. Studio, studio One was too dry. Right. This room was too reverberant. Okay. So in some of those early recordings, um, I think they used to like draw a massive curtain across the room to sort of divide the room up. Okay. But in the early 50s, they started experimenting with the sound of the room just to sort of tone it down a bit. So uh, the drapes you see here, which are now probably like probably one of the most recognisable parts of Studio Two. Right. So they, so they started hanging drapes. They were originally filled with um, like Cabot's quilt, which I think was a form of seaweed or type of seaweed. Um, highly flammable, apparently. So <laughs> some bright spark worked out in the 80s that it was, this is like a massive fire hazard. So they tore it down and replaced it with a, as close as they could. Um, but yeah, they added um, bass traps. So um, I see them you can see a bass trap up there. Just to sort of just try and, you know, control the room a bit more. I think it was a little bit um, out of control in the early days. So they sort of toned it down a bit. So booth, I don't remember that being here. Is that new? Um, the booze were added about four or five years ago. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, unlike Studio 3 and, oh, and Studio 1 as well, there's no, there was no isolation in this room, pretty much. I mean, they added these screens in 1961 right. to sort of try and be able to sort of divide the room up a little bit more. But apart from that, there was no, like, solid isolation, so we decided to sort of add these booths. Um, there's a smaller booth here up on the left as well. That was actually the original control room. Oh, right, okay. If you look at like really early footage, I mean, there wasn't much going on control room-wise in the early days. It would yeah. like be someone in a white lab coat with a cutting lathe and a very small, maybe four-channel mixer. That was it. So, it, you know, control rooms were a lot smaller. And it's when, you know, the gear became more elaborate, more tape machines, bigger mixing consoles, that sort of thing. So they moved the control room up to the next floor up in the, uh, in the late 50s. Okay. Um, just, just trying to get a bit more space. So it was, this, it was this configuration when the Beatles recorded here? Yes, yeah, yeah. Even the, the big swing out screens um, were installed before the Beatles started recording here. And apparently the engineers um, went away on a Friday night, came back on a Monday and the screens were installed without really anyone knowing. Um, and 
the um, one of the patch, patch bays for the microphones. They couldn't get to the, the, the oh no. They couldn't get to the microphones anymore, so they, they cut a hole in the left hand side there, um, so people could actually get to the patch bay. So. I recognise these pianos. Yes, the Challen piano. Right. And Mrs. Mills, the Steinway Virtue Grand. We've, we've sampled oh, yeah. this, yeah. yeah and, we've... and this is the really tacky sounding pia um, pub piano. It's amazing, it's extraordinary. So the, the, the hammers are lacquered, aren't they? Yeah, lacquered hammers. So it's an engineer guy called Stuart Eltham who was one of the first sort of generation of pop engineers here, if you like. And they're all, they're, he was just always looking for new sounds. Um, so, I mean, the Virtugram was originally designed to be like a small grand piano, believe it or not. But yeah, Stuart Eltham was like, he wanted the hammers lacquered okay. to get more of like a, a harder percussive sound. And he um, had the strings sort of slightly detuned, like harmoniously, harmoniously detuned, de but just to sort of get that chorusy sort of sound. Okay. It's like an effect, really. And so you've got, is that as a concert D? Concert D, yeah. yeah. And, and these kind of will float between the various studios, won't they? Concert D won't float around anywhere. That's no. a big beast. <laughs> but these two guys, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, they, they sort of float around. So I see you've got a, so there's a Yamaha and a Steinway, and then, then yeah. the studio have, uh, one have a, a Steinway as well. Yeah, studio one's got a Steinway, okay. yeah. Brilliant yeah. stuff. So these screens, when someone like, you know, I know that Radiohead have recorded here, and yeah, Oasis. Yeah, a, a lot of the Bends was recorded in here, yeah, Oasis, yeah, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and Muse, and... Wow. What, how do they kind of, do they kind of set up little kind of segments and screens and stuff like that? How does it work? Because it, it's a massive room. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great thing to witness, actually. You know, when a band sort of digs in, if you like, yeah. for, for maybe a week or a couple of weeks, yeah, the room sort of gets divided up, like a drum area and maybe a guitar area and piano area, and it sort of it becomes like, you know, the, the band's home for, right. for, for, you know, for those, you know, couple of weeks of recording. And I guess their techs work in the, those different zones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can get pretty busy in a room like this sometimes. Wow. When, when there's, just, there's just gear everywhere, synths, guitar pedals, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing to witness. It really is. And a great collaborative space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very inspiring space to be in, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And do people still use the screens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen screens pulled out and maybe drums been put in one corner and it's just a way of sort of dividing the room up a little bit if it just feels too big. Amazing. Now, I believe there's a very interesting room through here, isn't there? Yeah, well, the echo chamber, yeah. I'm very excited about this. So this, this is before they invented, uh, like, plate reverbs and stuff. They used this. Yeah, I mean, so obviously, I mean, I, I grew up around digital reverb, as I'm sure you did as well. And yeah. so, I mean, we take reverb for granted, I suppose. Um, but before digital reverb devices, there were what they called plate reverbs in the late 50s. Yeah. Uh, released by a company called EMT. So that was like a large piece of sheet metal and, you know, they, they, would, they would sort of play music down the sheet of metal effectively. Right. With a transducer down one end and a couple of pickups down the other end. Echo chambers were like the first way of creating um, reverb, if you like. Okay. Sort of like, before, um, before echo chambers, there was really no way of changing the sound of your recording. Sure. You completely relied on the room you recorded in. You had no options, really, to, to sort of change that sound afterwards. So with an echo chamber, what, what you've got effectively is like a, a tiled room with um, sort of pipes, if you like, or anything to diffuse the sound. Gotcha. Speaker down one end of the room, a couple right. of microphones down the other end of the room. And it, it's kind of like that sort of t <laughs> bathroom tile sort of vibes. It's like a, it creates reverb. That's incredible. And in incredibly short as well. Yeah, the chambers are notoriously short. I mean, Unless you use Studio One as an echo chamber, which is like <laughs> no, amazing. It's not a great smell in here, is it? No, it's, it smells uh, like it's been flooded or something. There was, there's been some damp problems over the years. It's got a certain charm to it. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Now, something that um, is famous about Abbey Road is the mic cupboard. Yes. And this is to do with uh, the ownership of EMI and stuff like that. Is that correct? Um, I mean. Abbey Road's been open since 1931, and just since 1931, we've been collecting microphones effectively right. and never really got rid of any. So, but there were more EMI studios, so the collection has has grown over the years from from some of those closures and yeah, stuff. Yeah, some of them are hand-me-downs actually. So, there was, um, 
uh, Pafé Morricone Studios in France. So that was an EMI studio. And I think when that closed down, we inherited a load of microphones. Right. Even more recently, I think, with uh, Olympic Studios. When Olympic Studios That's, closed yes. down, we inherited more microphones. So microphones keep, keep arriving. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we've got, I think, something like uh, over a thousand odd microphones. You know, That's it's incredible. So, and you've got some out here for us to look at. Yeah. So these are M50s, is that correct? Yeah, these are um, yeah, M50s. You've got to check, because some of the, there's the M49 and the M50. Yeah. So the M49, um, they were both released um, around 1952. Okay. Which is confusing, because they're called M50. You would have thought M1950. Oh, I see. I anyway, didn't know that. It's all a bit confusing, but um, yeah, I mean, the M49 was the microphone that allowed you to um, change the, the pickup pattern. Right. Gotcha. So you could go from figure of eight to cardioid to omnidirectional. Um, the M50 was set to, car, uh, to om omnidirectional, right. um, even though it was slightly darker on one side. Now, apparently the recording engineers didn't find the M50 particularly useful. They preferred the M49 because it was more flexible. Right. So by about the sort of um, mid 50s, there were like 30 plus M49s here in the building and only like five or six M50s, whereas now it's strangely, it's sort of like the reverse of that, like the M50 is the microphone of choice. I mean, the M50 is famous for the decatry. Yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see those in, in a three for, uh, configuration usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So left, center, right, and uh, like a famous configuration um, what devised in Decker Studios in the early 50s. Can I be really uncouth? I, I understand these are very valuable, aren't they, M50s? They are, yeah. Are you allowed to say what kind of value? I, I, mean, I, I, don't, I mean, if you could find an M50 secondhand, you'd probably be looking at about 10 grand, I imagine, but maybe like an Abbey Road one, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I don't know how you put price on that. And do you know how many you have of these? M50s, we've probably got about 10 wow. M50s, I would have thought. Because they've, they've ne I mean, there, there is an M150, which is a new thing, but these, yeah. it's something very special about these original designs, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the capsules, the valves, uh, the capacitors, the resistors, you know, I mean, yeah, there is, there is a reissue, but people just prefer the original mics. I mean, they've got a certain sound to them, the original mics. And I guess what's really exciting about these mics is, is the people that have sung into them over the years. So you're suddenly presented with a mic that m maybe Eartha Kitt has sung into or something like that. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, so these mics have been here since, you know, since the 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, yeah, I mean, who knows who's sung into them over the years. But I mean, yeah, I mean, chances are maybe this U47 down here, which we're sort of shamelessly hiding down here. Let's, let's get it out, shall we? You know, I mean, maybe the Beatles recorded it, um, into this microphone or the Hollies or Scylla Black, you know. I mean, these were, these were the workhorse microphones at the end of the day. Really exciting, isn't it? Yeah, so here we, this is an M, sorry, a U47. Because there's U48s and U47s. So the U40, um, they got different polar patterns, basically. Right. And some are taller than others. Apparently, like, um, a couple of years later, they changed some of the um, resistors and managed to get, get it more sort of condensed. Um, so some, there's tall ones and shorter ones. And I guess every mic sounds different, doesn't it? Because of the age and because of the, 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 the TLC it's, that they've had. Yeah, I mean, every mic is different. I mean, e even every um, model is different. Like, so serial numbers are different. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I remember um, I was assisting um, John Bryan uh, on a Fiona right, Apple a record. Massive, massive fan of his. And I mean, I was kind of shocked at the time, but he, he came in and he said to me, look, can you get all your valve microphones out and put them out on this floor here? And there's a lot of valve microphones. And I was just like, oh my God, that's uh, so much work. Um, but but what, what he did was effectively, he, would, um, he had a pair of headphones on and he sort of walked down the line and just spoke into every single microphone. Um, so all the M50s, all the M49s, all the U67s, all the C12s. And I, um, would, well, I would note down the ones he liked, like serial numbers, because they all sound slightly different and they've all got slightly different characters. And it's a very personal thing, I suppose. Um, what you might consider your favourite serial number may not be what I consider my favourite serial number. But the point was that, um, you know, John wanted to get a collection of serial numbers that, that he thought were the best ones to use for the, his recording. Probably the most sort of sought after microphone in the world is the U47. Um, the thing is, it's like, I mean, Part of the sound is, is, is the valve, the valve itself inside the microphone. Um, 
and it's probably like probably one of the most rarest. Well, it's probably the rarest valve there is because oh, really? they stopped making. Um, it's the Telefunk and VF14. Um, they stopped making them probably in like the mid 50s. Neumann had a problem from the get-go, basically. Wow. But uh, you know, if you found a VF14 valve now, they're pretty about three thousand pounds. Um, just for a single valve and it's because like you know once they go they go like the valves don't last forever as you know um, so the problem is it's like you know we got we got we got a stash of them here at Abbey Road if you okay. like so we're gonna be right for like the foreseeable future but um, you know U47s won't be around forever with the original valve in um, so yeah I mean just little things like that kind of make you know, old gear is great if you've got someone to look after it and maintain it. Yeah. Uh, and we're very lucky here at Abbey you know, we have a fantastic technical team. Um, so this stuff, it, it bears like a sense of uh, responsibility, if you like, to sort of maintain this older gear yeah. um, and keep it up to scratch. Amazing. The M49, the capsule in the M49 is actually quite a big capsule. It's the M7 capsule, which is the same capsule that's in the U47. So if I just open it up here, it's quite a chunky capsule. Here we okay. Are. That's the M7 capsule. Um, so, which is, you know, it's a large diaphragm microphone at the end of the day. Right. Um, but if you look inside the M50, it's actually, which always, well, it's, it surprised me when, when I first found out, but it's actually quite a small capsule inside oh, the M50. Is it? You'd imagine it to be like a big, it looks like a big capsule microphone, right? Because um, it's the same size as the M49. Um, but if we open this guy up, you'll see what I mean. Here we go. Done this before. So yeah, it's actually a really small capsule. Wow. Encased in like plastic casing, um, which is actually the same capsule as a KM53. So wow. it looks like a large diaphragm microphone, but it isn't. But um, it gives a big sound. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Well, should we see where that big sound goes? Up yes. to the control room. So I'm quite nervous watching you do this. I've never actually seen I'm nervous like <laughs> doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess this up now. OK, great. So up we go. Cool. OK, let's Excellent. go check it out, yeah. So massive loads of tie lines. Yeah, I mean, the room, the floor can get pretty busy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, there are loads. They're everywhere, aren't they? Yeah, there's A lines and B lines, um, so it's all doubled up. Um, then, of course, like fold back for the musicians. Of course. So headphone feeds, that sort of thing. Uh, and just other tie lines. You, you can never have enough tie lines, as far as I'm concerned. It's like, you know, really useful. Brilliant stuff. Oh, this is exciting. Oh, it's good to be back. You've, you've worked in here, right? Yeah, I've done a couple of scores in here. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the biggest control room, is it? It's not. It's not the biggest control room. It's, it, I, it's all about down there in Studio yeah. 2. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, ideally you'd have a bigger control room. But, I mean, we actually did extend it about four or five years ago. We sort of went back a bit. Right. Um, but, you know, yeah, the, the control room can get busy, but, you know, it's part of the charm in working studio too. Absolutely. So, Neve 88R? Yep, yep, Neve 88R, yep. 60, 60 channel, I believe. Yep, 60. And B&W, they're all, all over Abbey Road, these B&W speakers, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, these are actually the brand new ones. Um, we literally got these delivered, like, a week ago, two weeks ago. Uh, ATCs as well. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of B&W speakers. I mean, like, like a, they're off official speaker partner. OK, I got you. And that's and why. And there's BMW surrounds as well. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That looks absolutely incredible. What is it? It is the Red 17 mixing console, 1958. Uh, EMI Design is uh, designed uh, in collaboration with EMI German. I mean, EMI had factories and you know scientists all over the world. So this was a collaboration between London and EMI Germany. A guy called Peter Berkowitz designed it. Um, it's it's Essentially, what you're looking at is probably the first incarnation of what we imagine a mixing console to look like. And what I mean by that is like faders and EQ on every single channel. Mixing consoles before this tended to be like a, a series of dials in front of you. Right. Um, like the, um, you know, the old Universal Audio Desk, for example, you know, okay. that sort of thing. So 
faders was like you know it was quite a big step forward i suppose um and all valve um it's all powered by v72 power amps so like even like the echo sen goes for like a valve power amp it's just wow heavy very warm um in terms of heat i'm talking about here as well it sounds warm as well but <laughs> um it generates a lot of heat basically but i mean yeah i mean it's built like a tank it's just i mean it still works it's still used it's got a beautiful sound to it and the eq is just absolutely lush um fixed you know 10k 100 hertz you can't do anything fancy with it it just is what it is but it just adds this sound this sparkle yeah. how many channels is it a... so it's eight channels uh, it okay. means this is stereo desk only okay. so the red 37 was designed for four track this was designed before four track was even a thing wow um so straight to stereo or mono or twin track i think that's what the duo's for right the four four track tape machines they have what they call twin track where they record like the backing track and one track well the left track if you like and then they, uh, that would leave them another track, like the right track to do vocals or all that sort of stuff. So a lot of those early Beatles albums, when they say it's stereo, you've got all the music panned on one side oh, and all yes. the vocal panned on the other side. Because it was actually designed to be mixed in mono, you know. That... Of course, yes. Now, I've heard, I like those, it's terrible, those mixes when you hear them in a pub where you're next to one speaker <laughs> and the right speaker's at the other side of the room. And yeah. you can kind of, all you can hear is the drums. And, but this is like, it's, it, this is not a, a relic. This was really a workhorse. It was used on so many records, wasn't it? This, this model of desk. Yeah, I mean, this, this one was designed for, believe it or not, this is a, considered a mobile desk. Wow. Um, it splits into three sections. But yeah, the Red 17 was like the mobile stereo version, the Red 37, the Red 51, uh, which was slightly bigger. They were the four track versions. But yeah, I mean, pretty much every record recorded um, in Abbey Road from the late 50s to the late 60s was done through a red desk and beyond in some cases. The transistorized desks arrived at Abbey Road in 1968, um, okay. the, uh, the TG. Okay. So this is all valve, and then the new thing was transistorized desks. Which, it was actually a problem for the engineers because they were used to working with 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 valve um, circuitry, if you like. They were used to like, you know, really pushing mm -hmm. the levels. I see. Oh yeah. When, if you did try to do that on the transistor desk, things started to break up. So they had to. I think they had to like really rethink their their oh, way of working in a way. And you've got. I mean, there's some usual suspects in your your outboard. I can see a three three six oh nine and amazing teletronics but there's some stuff that i've not seen before particularly this stuff down here yeah so that's that's the emi tg gear that's the transistorized gear so this is stuff that's been lifted from the mixing console this is actually from the transfer console the mastering console so when the tg desk was designed by mike bachelor in the late 60s eventually by the mid 70s they decided they wanted like um versions of that to use in the cutting rooms and the mastering rooms gotcha, yeah so that's what this is this is actually from the mastering rooms so you got eq um spreader um you know, like sort of mastering techniques you know sort of spreading the sound out gotcha. sort of phase related that sort of thing uh filters and um compressors and limiters uh, but that, I mean, the TG gear, I mean, the compressors are really aggressive, if you're right. honest, and they've got a certain sounds and people love them. Um, the EQ is really musical. It's uh, all the frequencies are based around the key of C and um, they just, they're, just, oh, they're, just, they're just lovely, lovely EQs. Oh, that's, I didn't, I didn't know oh, that. That makes total sense, but it's not, I, I'm never knew. It's so lovely to see the mixture of the old and the new. So you've got that, the TG stuff, and then you've got a, uh, Bracasti, and I guess that's the spirit of Abbey Road, isn't it? Yeah, be best of old and new, I say. I mean, we're really lucky to have the latest cutting edge gear. Yeah. But we can also pull out mics from the 30s and more well, console from 1958, and just, yeah, you just kind of, you know, mix and match and get different flavours. And that's part of the attraction, isn't it? It's why people like Oasis come to record here, because of it's the real deal. It's not an imitation, it is actually what people have used over the decades. Yeah, I mean, I think Abbey Road is unique. Especially, I mean, you know, unfortunately, a lot of studios have closed down. A lot of the classic studios are no longer with us. But I mean, you come to Abbey Road, you've got a, a, a big room to play with. You've got older gear to play with if you want to. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. You've got the latest cutting edge recording gear to play with. Um, all of that, you know, with you know the teams here at Abbey Road, it, it kind of creates like a unique flavour. I think heritage, isn't it? That's I guess what it is. I've never seen these. These look absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is the RS124 compressor. These were a bit of an oddity, really. I mean, these were described as the secret weapon of the recording engineer back in the 60s, uh, and effectively what they were was um, one of the per first pop engineers here, a guy called Peter Baum. 
he was in correspondence with uh, another EMI studio, Capital Studios in LA quite a lot. And they would get like the latest gear from America, obviously they were based in America. Mm -hmm. And they recommended to Peter this Altec compressor. So off the back of that recommendation, Abbey Road took delivery of like you know, five or six of these Altec compressors. And um, the, it's quite normal back then, or it's standard policy back then for the, um, the techies, any new piece of gear that was non-EMI that came through the doors, they'd open it up and sort of see what's going on before they even allowed you to plug it in, you know, because this is from an outside source, we don't know what's in there, all that sort of stuff. Um, anyway, um, people like um, Bill Livy, Len Page, Mike Batchelor, they, they, they opened this thing up and they were just like, this did not like what they saw whatsoever. Really? They changed all the valves because they thought the valves were too noisy. They changed them for um, quieter valves. Uh, resistors, capacitors were changed to be more in spec with what they thought were, you know, better capacitors and resistors. Um, they added, um, the original Altec just had a volume control, input control. So they added like an output attenuator, they added recovery, like a, re a release time. So basically the only thing that was recognisable was the meter, the Altec meter. Everything else had completely changed. Totally pimped. Completely different beast, yeah. <laughs> completely pimped, completely different beast. So they were un unique to Abbey Road. They, they just didn't exist anywhere else. And they just happened to be used on very famous recordings and had this this certain sound to them. If you compare it to like a Fairchild, which has got super, super fast attack time, yeah, like 0.2 milliseconds, um, these guys sort of, some, they're all different as well. So some had about a attack time of about 30 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. But the point is, you know, if you put a bass guitar through there, you, the initial transient of the note would actually get through and yeah. then it would grab the sound. Um, so it had quite a sort of a sort of, um, sort of punchy sound, if you like. Gotcha. They actually weren't used for a long time. A lot of this gear fell out of favour in the mid-70s. You know, newer gear was coming through the, the doors. in the 80s as well. Well into the 80s. This stuff, no one was interested in it. Um, and um, uh, luckily, a lot of it was kind of hidden away in cupboards and whatnot. Um, some of it got trashed, unfortunately, or went to archives and then got donated to charitable causes like hospital radio stations, that sort of thing. I mean, we found a, a tape of an old... BTR valve tape machine that used to belong to Abbey Road. Um, it, we found it in the university. The university contacted us, um, Southampton University, and said, right. Is, "Did this used to belong to you?" And we looked up the serial numbers. Like, yeah, it did. How did you get? They had no idea how they got yeah. it. But we think it was donated to them through archives. You know, because it's like a charitable thing to donate to a university. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense when you think about it. So a lot of gear was lost. Some of it was trashed, but some of it was um, kind of kept and stored away in cupboards and all that sort of stuff so um these didn't these were stored away until like early 2000 it was uh, john bryan again actually okay um he was just like have you guys got any rs124s i had like, never heard of these before it's like I, I know a man who might know it's lester smith like, okay asked lester if he had any R rs124s or knew anything about them he's like yeah I'll see what i can find and he came back you know that's an cool. hour later with an rs24 plugged it up it's like oh my god that's the sound you know it's that's amazing. And I guess that's what's so interesting about the, the relationship between the studio and the artists is that you, you, uh, you are dealing with the demands of the artist. And yeah. that's why, where you get this lovely cyclicism because of their own personal heritage and taste that they've made from stuff that they've listened to in their past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it all ends up these days in Pro Tools, uh -huh. but you've got an absolutely wonderful looking tape machine. Yeah, so this is the uh, the J37. I mean, this is it. This is the four track tape machine that that was used on quite a few famous recordings. Uh, I think so I just think that we have to like we have to talk about the Beatles and their yeah. seminal records yeah. were recorded on four track by and large. Yeah, which if you I don't know think of a song like a Day in the Life, right? That's a pretty complicated production recorded on four tracks. I think is like quite impressive really and these are not stereo tracks these are four mono tracks four mono tracks yeah so what they what it is mind-blowing i mean if you said to a band now you're going to record your album using only four tracks i think they'd just run a mile right it's yeah like freak everyone out four track tape machine you know maybe track one is like I don't know, drums and bass and maybe a guitar overdub and piano and maybe some hand claps or percussion or whatever they would take those they would take another bring in another four track tape machine into the into the into the control room and put those four tracks down onto one track, mix it down like a premix onto one track of a second tape machine. So that would be like the backing track. Yeah, yeah. So that would leave you then three more tracks to overdub on. Um, then they'd fill that one up, and then they'd do another bounce, 
they do it up like four or five times maybe. Right. Um, so like you imagine if you're doing your final mix on your four tracks and you decide the snare drum's too quiet, there's nothing you can do about it. Like that is the mix. Um, so quite often you, they would overdub more, they'd do another snare overdub because right. the original snare had been lost in all the sort of, in the pre-mixes. Um, it's very committed way, it was a very committed way of recording. Whereas now everything's spread out, everything's got its own track and you, hundreds of, of, of plugins and yeah. Yeah, you, you don't have to make, I'm not saying this is bad, but you don't have to make a decision necessarily now until the very last moment. Whereas back then, you had to make decisions like this. This is going to be the volume for the drums. This will be the volume from the bass. And we're now going to commit that and then start adding more tracks on top of it. You know, so you, you were having to sculpt it as you as you as you went along. And I guess that what, what makes me so amazed, like retrospectively, just actually looking at this and imagining working like that is that they were still so and certainly with George Martin was so adventurous with the recording techniques and they really pushed the boundary there where surely playing it safe would have been the the most sensible way of going about things yeah I mean it, it was pretty rock and roll <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day um, yeah I mean these machines were abused a lot of the gear was abused I mean what I mean by that is it was used in ways that was never designed to be used the concept of a tape machine is to capture a piece of music or a recording as purely as possible, right? But, uh, you know, they started to do things like, we know, what if we like really drive the input signal going into the tape machine and yeah. sort of like crunch it up, like, you know, sort of distort it, if you like. Things like taking the tape off, do a recording, take the tape off, turn it upside down and press play, and then it's, it's effectively playing backwards. Uh, things like, you know, even put, like putting your thumb on the, on the, um, over the spool as it's playing to sort of like slow the tape up. You kind of get phasey effects and flanging effects and all that sort of stuff. Um, using the very speed control to sort of speed the machine up and slow it down and play things at half speed and just like any any way of like you know manipulating sounds with what was very limited equipment. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm waving this box of EMI tape around. Um, <laughs> EMI tape is like it's the only tape I've ever experienced that doesn't need to be baked. Okay. So, like, if you take a tape from like the seventies or the eighties, even till like you know nineties into two thousands, chances are if you put it on a tape machine and press play, the oxide will sort of come off onto the tape heads, and the tape heads will gunk up, and you, you have a process called baking, where you put it in an oven at a very very low temperature for like three or four days, and then you've got like a period, like a window of like maybe forty eight hours to get it and transfer it digitally. Okay. EMI tape never needs to be baked. Amazing. I don't know what they used to put in this stuff, but like probably highly illegal now. Arsenic. Probably, God knows. Um, but yeah, never needs to be baked. There's like over 50 odd valves what? in this tape machine. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Do you want to have a look inside? Oh yes, please. I think, I think it just pops open like a bonnet in a car. You know? He says, here we go. Whoa. Yeah, it's pretty, it's a bit of a beast. Um, that's, see the capstan motor moving around. Okay. The only lubricant we can find that is actually fine enough to keep that running around is um, what uh, uh, watchmakers use. Oh. Um, we get it imported from uh, Switzerland, I think. Yeah, it's like, it's, I mean, it still works. It's, and do people use it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, well, we used it for the, the strings. Um, it still works, still got a great sound, especially when you use it with original ME tape. Um, it's just got that sound to it. Now, we're talking about people being, working with, you know, restrictive technology, but mm. and it's, it, it, it wasn't restrictive in the day because they didn't know what was coming. This would have been really ultra high tech back in the day. This was like, yeah, obviously cutting edge at one point. I mean, even before this generation of four track Abbey Road, before that, we were using Telefunken four tracks, which were like bigger. I mean, it sounds silly, but that was a problem because you had to have the, um, the tape op in a separate room. So there's like a communication problem. Um, when these came out, they were small enough to actually just sit in the back of the control room and they weren't too noisy. And that just like, and instantly communication improved, like just like that. Uh, and that meant everyone could be more creative. Like the bands themselves would start, you know, manipulating the tape and playing around with the tape and all that sort of stuff. Whereas before it was all sort of like tucked away. Coaty, yeah, 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 well, that sort of thing, yeah. Um, so even little things like that, it sounds silly, but I think made a massive difference to the creative process. Right. Wow, oh, that's a real career ender. that take your fingers off. Yeah, that's happened almost a few times in my career. <laughs>
Brilliant stuff. Well, listen, Mirek, thank you so much for affording us this time and, you know, to have a peer and, and, and a poke around. It's been just absolutely mind-blowing. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. So, if you have any questions about today's cribs, do put them in the comments down below. We do have a look at them and I'll endeavour to answer and maybe forward you the odd uh, uh, query as and, as and when they're arise. Okay, well, let's, let's see what turns up, shall we? They're, they're nice. They're nice, this <laughs> lot. One of these for Mirek. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so and remember to ding that bell to be notified the next time we put a video up. Lots of really exciting stuff coming up with Abbey Road too. Absolutely. Brilliant exciting. stuff. Thanks for watching till the end and see you next time.